possible. And we'll be sure to share our contact information in the end in case you want to get a hold of either one of us. Okay, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so as Cristina mentioned, my name is Sheila Soto and I work with the mobile health unit program here in Tucson. We cover all of Southern Arizona. We travel to Pinal, Pima, uh, Santa Cruz, Cochise, Graham, Greenlee, and uh, Yuma County. And then we have our sister mobile unit program in Phoenix and they cover Maricopa County and more of the Northern counties. Uh, and Catherine can get into, into that when she gets to her um, section as well. So the mission of the mobile health unit is to provide access to health and prevention services to promote healthy lifestyle choices to vulnerable, underserved, rural, and homeless communities in Arizona. Um, like I mentioned before, we have two mobile units. Our mobile unit in Tucson focuses on Southern Arizona and the central, uh, the Phoenix mobile unit focuses on central Arizona. Uh, we are two of 11 mobile health units that were created to be an extension of the Ventanillas de Salud at the Mexican consulates. So if any of you have ever gone to a Mexican consulate and gone to the uh, windows of health, the Ventanillas de Salud, it's kind of like a one-stop shop where you can go and try to find resources that you need, um, mostly geared towards health, but usually the people running the, the windows of health are very good at connecting people to other resources. So our mobile units are basically an extension of that. We're actually going into the community, trying to reach our population because we know that not everyone uses the Mexican consulates. So when we were first created, um, our target community was the Latino community. Um, it has since then kind of evolved. We've never turned anybody away, but now we have more of a heavy emphasis in going to rural border um, areas and in Phoenix, well, they're always busy all the time because there's just so many areas of need in, in their big city as well. Um, so our two mobile units are a little bit different in that we're stationed at a university. A lot of the other mobile units are um, part of federally qualified health centers or part of clinics. Um, so ours are mostly ran by um, community health workers, that's uh, primarily who is in our staff. We also have um, some coordinators and some leads. And um, also we recently started a new project with HIV. Um, so we will go into that here shortly. So our main objectives are to provide access to health and prevention services. So we do this via the um, health screenings and also health education. We refer to federally qualified health centers as well as other local clinics. So sometimes we'll see people who are unable to afford the uh, sliding fee scale. So then there are free clinics in, in town that we can help refer them to. And we also launch preventative health campaigns. So for example, um, one of our busiest months is October, which is um, breast cancer month. It's also the first month that we start our flu campaign and it's also domestic violence month. Um, so this is kind of who consists of our team in general. So we have interprofessional students that come from public health, nursing, and medicine. Um, in Phoenix, I think they have more um, students that are also from pharmacy and PA students. So um, as I mentioned before, the majority of our staff are community health workers. We also partner with federally qualified health centers um, and the county and state health departments. Um, so the health screenings that we typically provide are these ones listed here at the top of the slide. So blood glucose, blood pressure, lipid panels, HbA1c, and um, physical measurements to calculate the BMI. All of the services are free with the mobile health unit. We don't charge anyone. Um, so usually what happens when a person comes in is they fill out this one page um, questionnaire that asks them like basic demographic information about their family history, their personal medical history, um, and then we go on to do the health screenings. Um, and depending on their levels of glucose, we can do an HbA1c. So when we're taking the glucose then and there, um, that level usually tells us how they are at that point in time. but if that level ends up being high, we do an A1C and the A1C kind of tells us an average of their glucose levels in the last three months. So it's a little more accurate and we um, try to provide that to people that um, have their glucose really high at the time of screening. 
Um, with the blood pressure as well, after we take their blood pressure three times, if the blood pressure is coming out high, we do a lipid panel test. So for this test, it, we can calculate their um, cholesterol, the triglycerides, their LDL, um, HDLs, and then we just provide education on all of these levels that we are measuring. Um, now, and especially in the Phoenix mobile unit, they've been able to start with the HIV and syphilis testing. Um, so it's part of most of the services that they provide when they go out to the communities. Um, and our mobile health unit here in Southern Arizona should be starting um, late January, early February of next year. We also distribute COVID-19 at-home testing kits. Um, we also have Narcan and Naloxone kits to distribute to participants and community partners. Um, we are right now doing COVID-19 vaccinations as well as part of the Move Up program, and I'll talk about that um, later on. Um, it, here in Southern Arizona, we partner with the Walgreens that provides free flu shots. So um, before, they used to come out with us to our events and they'd administer the vaccines for free. Um, but now, um, because they're a little understaffed, we send our participants over to that Walgreens and everybody that we um, that we refer to their store can get the free flu shot. They don't have to show any type of proof of anything and they can get vaccinated. Um, we also work a lot with um, Assured Imaging and Arizona Complete Health. So Arizona Complete Health is one of our sponsors and they pay for mammograms for the community members that we see. So we partner with Arizona Complete Health to try to find the communities that need access to these free mammograms. And usually it's between 25 to 50 people that we help them get in order for the mobile, the mammogram mobile unit to go and provide these, this free service. Um, dental screenings, it's usually for us here in Southern Arizona with Pima County. Health Center, um, they would come with us and do free um, varnishing for children, N not adults, unfortunately, we don't have for adults. Um, and then food bus distribution in Phoenix. And as I mentioned before, we do education of the health screenings, but also on health insurance and just in general, how the US um, health system works. So a lot of the participants that we see are mostly immigrants. Um, that being said, usually the healthcare system in their home country is very different than here in the U.S. So a lot of times um, the reason that people are not accessing health or utilizing health services is just because they don't know how. So um, we do our most to try to walk people through this process and to do follow-ups with them as well. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we refer to federally qualified health centers or other local clinics, but we also refer to other places like food banks, diaper banks, um, basically anything that the person needs, we try our hardest to connect that person to that service. Um, and then we have an active follow-up process where our community health workers will call back the participants that we see that we referred in a month to three months, just to make sure that they were able to be seen or get the services that they were provided. Sometimes what happens is um, some of our participants do not like, for example, let's say the provider that they're seeing, um, and they feel tied to that when in reality, they really have the option to go to another place, even if it's within the same clinic. So again, part of that follow-up is to make sure that they're um, getting the services that they want, and if not, um, helping them um, find another provider or another clinic. Um, we also invite them again to our health screening events to make sure that their numbers have come down. Um, so that we, we have like a pretty big list of people that we call back in both Phoenix and Tucson. Um, again, just trying to see if there's anything, any other service that we could connect our participants with. So these are the um, diseases that we tend to focus on the most, which are cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, right now, um, COVID-19. We also do education on urine referrals with tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse. Um, cancer, we work a lot with the Cancer Center here at the U of A as well. Um, and we do education on STIs. So how uh, does a mobile unit identify the locations that we'll go to? Um, so either we have our community health workers who already know the community and they can identify the places that we need to go to, or we have organizations that reach out to us directly. Um, so there's either schools that are having events, churches that are having events, or um, we work a lot with the 
um, local health departments in most of these country counties, and they're also the ones who will identify areas that they want us to go to. Um, so then we'll host these events with the whoever the sponsoring organization is or partnering organization, and or we'll be a part of a health fair. We'll just be an additional service at a health fair. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we review the health screening results with the participants. We provide individualized health education and try to help them improve their health and wellness. Um, we do the follow the referral to the federally qualified health centers and then the follow up, as I just mentioned. So these numbers are a little um, dated, but we will get into the newer ones in a bit too. Um, so in from January to May, um, January 2016 to May 2022, the Phoenix Mobile Unit um, has seen over 13,000 participants. They've provided over 60,000 services. The majority of the people that they see are female. Um, and as you can see, um, their age range of the participants that they see are pretty um, scattered. I would think the, the most seen are between 40 to 49 years. Um, but they also see quite a bit of younger folks as well. Um, you can see the results of the health screenings with about half get, getting high blood pressure and over 80% having a BMI reading of overweight or obese. Um, something that I always like to talk about is the monthly household income. So the monthly household income includes any uh, sources of income coming into the household. So that includes if one person's working, two people are working, um, a lot of the times the people that we see live in multi-generational homes, which means that that means there's more than likely more sources of income. But even then, um, our participants are re reporting um, less than $3,000 a month. And that's for about 82% 82 per 82 of the participants they see in Phoenix. And then um, of those who have health insurance, it's about 42%. And again, most of those are saying that it's emergency access. And as we know that emergency access is not the same as access. Um, the mobile health unit in Tucson started a year after the, the unit in Phoenix. And we've seen um, close to 8,000 participants and provided over 30,000 services. Again, the majority of the people that we see are female. And here we do tend to see more of an older population in the areas that we, we serve. Um, about 40 to 60 plus is the community that we're seeing. Um, blood of glucose results at the time of screenings, about half of them are high. Uh, a little over half have a high blood pressure reading and um, close to the 80% have a BMI reading of overweight and obese. And again, almost 70% of our participants are reporting a monthly household income less than $3,000 a month. And about 62 of our participants at that time um, had been reporting having health insurance and then um, most of them being emergency access. It has since then changed a lot, which uh, I will share with you here soon too. So another program that we have with the mobile health unit, it's called um, the Mobile Outreach Vaccination and Education for Underserved Populations or the Move Up Project. So this is funded by several different entities, as you can see there, but our main being the AHEAD program, which is from um, the University of Arizona. And these are the counties that are that fall within this uh, move up grant, which is Maricopa, Coconino, Apache, Santa Cruz, Cochise, Pima, and Yuma County. Um, Phoenix started back in February of 2021, and uh, they're still continuing, and we are as well. Um, so the Phoenix mobile unit started first with the senior and public housing. So at that time when COVID started, as you can remember, there was not enough um, places for people to go get vaccinated and there was not enough vaccines. So the mobile unit became one of the outreach arms for the um, for Maricopa uh, Public Health Department um, to where they were going directly to these housing facilities and vaccinating people on site. It was very organized. It was very well done. Um, but then from there, they went on to help the city of Phoenix at the parks and doing um, drive through uh, vaccination events and also hosting them at and these larger gyms. Um, then soon farms started hearing about what the mobile units were doing. And um, so they would go out to the rooster farms, out to um, dairy industries. Um, again, they were vaccinating over a thousand people each time that they'd go um, to provide the, the COVID vaccine. Um, they also went to some meat packing plants like JBS and Tyson. 
Um, and some of these areas, some of these um, industries, it was actually really great because they were rewarding their workers for getting vaccinated. So some of them would give them two, two pay days off um, if they were to receive the COVID vaccines, just because they also didn't want to see an outbreak. As we know, all of these industries that I listed are were essential or are essential, um, but during this time they had to keep working. So they, they had access to the vaccine at quicker times than other um, workers were able to. And here in Southern Arizona, the first group that we started vaccinating were the truckers in Nogales. Um, so as we know, Nogales is one of the cities that sees a lot of truck drivers um, as they travel from, from Mexico and go to different parts of the US. Um, so we started vaccinating them um, close to the border, but not on the border. Um, and that was also in collaboration with the Arizona Department of Transportation. Um, soon after the maquilas, which are factories in Mexico started hearing of what we were doing and also um, asked if we could go vaccinate their workers. And this was done in um, collaboration with CBP. And um, they allowed us to use their dock to vaccinate um, these workers. Um, and then we had other companies reach out. We also had um, children, parents of children asking us to vaccinate at schools as well. And then from there started our bigger, um, I think effort for us in Southern Arizona, which were the ports of entry. So um, here I listed some of the strategic partners because obviously it wasn't just the mobile unit by itself that we're able to vaccinate everybody. It took a large team of all these people that are listed here. Um, the first being, and probably the most important being the Arizona Department of Health because they allowed us to use vaccine that was close to expire. So by the time that we started with the ports of entry, the COVID vaccine had already been available um, to us here for quite a while. And the rates of vaccination were had gone down significantly because everybody that had wanted to get vaccinated or needed to get vaccinated had already received their vaccine. Um, but then we had that group of people that were very hesitant that did not want to get the vaccine. And so a lot of um, these doses of vaccine were, going, were getting wasted and Thankfully, the Department of Health Services was willing to donate those vaccines to us so that we could administer them at the ports of entry. Um, and then here in Tucson, we worked with the Family and Community Medicine Mobile Health Unit, and they provided the clinicians to go and, and vaccinate with us, along with other nursing students and um, public health students. We worked with NAU, ASU, Mayo, G GCU, and Midwestern Universities. Um, with the different uh, sets of students that I listed there, with the local health departments in Kochi, Santa Cruz, Pima, Maricopa, Coconino, Apache, and Yuma. Um, one of our largest uh, partners were also the Mexican consulates, especially along the border. So Douglas, Anogales, Tucson, Yuma, and the Phoenix um, consulates all worked with us to get in contact with the leaders in Sonora, Mexico, to try to um, streamline as much of this process as possible. And um, like I said, the growers that reached out to us, the employers that reached out to us from Mexico, the local health entities from the Mexican side as well, the federally qualified health centers along um, on our side, on Arizona, also helped by providing vaccines and clinicians um, and trusted influencers and stakeholders of both sides and community health workers, again, on both sides of the border. Uh, and CBP, sorry, sorry, I couldn't see the bottom. But, and, and obviously CBP as well, because they allowed us to use the dock. Um, and they would also kind of help uh, control the traffic of the buses coming to the ports. Um, so they'd have dedicated staff that all they would do is help transport those buses to the dock and then help um, the people getting off the bus, getting them back on the bus. So this is just a couple of the pictures from Central Arizona when they're doing health screenings um, and COVID vaccinations. If I remember correctly, this is at a food distribution site. And the picture on the left is of, the, of a couple of community health workers in um, San Luis, Arizona in Yuma County um, promoting the COVID vaccine. And the picture on the right was when we first started vaccinating truck drivers in Nogales, Arizona. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, it took a lot of us to be able to do the vaccinations at the Arizona-Sonora border. And I kind of tried to do a map of 
the process of how all of this worked. So the red is um, entities here um, in Arizona, in the US side, and then the blue are the partners from Mexico, and then the black are a mixture of both. Um, so on the Mexican side, um, the local municipal, municipal health offices were the ones that were promoting and trying to get people to enroll in the vaccine. Um, and I should mention that part of the, the reason of this need was because um, Mexico was, wasn't receiving as enough, enough vaccines to vaccinate all the people in their towns. Um, so there was this large need of people. On the first day that they announced that we were gonna be vaccinating at the ports of entry, um, they had over, uh, if I remember correctly, over 13,000 people that wanted to sign up to get the vaccine, but we only had a thousand slots available. So that started like a ripple effect of how many times we had to go and how many times we had to go vaccinated for first and second doses. So the municipal um, health offices were the ones that were announcing our efforts and um, getting people to sign up for either if it was a thousand, a thousand five hundred or the two thousand vaccines that were going to be administered. Um, at certain dates, they would have these at the local health, local town halls or where people would go and sign up. Um, we had local universities from Sonora, Mexico that would send um, some of their clinicians to help us vaccinate because sometimes we wouldn't have enough here with our students um, from U of A. And then we also had local enforcements and civil protections that would kind of help guide the buses. As I mentioned um, earlier, there was a lot of people that want to get vaccinated. And because it was a high need, sometimes we'd have some participants that would try to climb on the buses, um, even though it wasn't their turn to yet. So we needed somebody to kind of help um, navigate that on the Mexico side. Um, so the local enforcement, that, that was their role in this process. Um, there was also several businesses that donated buses for them to bring these people over to us. So uh, for example, Tufesa donated like 20 buses each time we had an event just so that we could have enough people um, brought to the ports of entry. Um, and then like I mentioned, the students both here and in Mexico, and Mexico would also send their Red Cross. So if there was ever an urgent or emergent uh, case, they would just get on the on the ambulance and they would be taken to the nearest hospital in, in Mexico. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the local organizations like CHEC and the federally qualified health centers. So Chiricahua would send personnel, Mariposa would send personnel. Um, so it was really a lot of us uh, at these ports of entry doing um, just amazing work and vaccinating um, thousands of people. So these are just some pictures of um, the days of vaccination. Um, both of these are in Nogales. And again, you'll see on the picture on the lower right hand side, um, it's people lining up. Uh, and they'd have like a ticket of the time that they were supposed to arrive with the bus number. Um, and these are some pictures from inside the ports. All of these are in Nogales. Um, so again, this one's a little dated, but from February to April, um, the mobile health units, both in Phoenix and Tucson, administer more than 60,000 vaccines. Um, you can kind of see the breakdown of the different types of vaccines. And then um, here in the center, you can kind of see by county. Um, so uh, Maricopa County had the most administered vaccines, uh, followed by Cochise, Santa Cruz, uh, Pima and Yuma County. Um, in the ports of entry, it was over 40,000 in all of the ports of entry, Nogales, Douglas, Lukeville, San Luis, and Naco. You can kind of see that, that breakdown here too. Um, so that was really quick about the uh, health screenings and the, I mean, hold on, did I? Yes, I said, sure. Okay, so I'll let Catherine really quickly talk about street medicine, which is another part of the mobile health unit. Yeah, hi there. Thank you so much, Shayla, for that um, awesome presentation. I'm like, every time I see all the numbers and like the breadth of like what the mobile health unit does, it's always, it always takes me back. So um, yeah, you're awesome. Congrats on becoming a doctora as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, with the street medicine uh, presentation. I have a PowerPoint that I'll just share here. Get that started. All right. 
Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I am the lead of Street Medicine Phoenix. Uh, I'm a health educator here at the College of Public Health in Phoenix. Um, so within those community outreach and engagement program, there's mobile health units, uh, Ventanias de Salud, uh, Street Medicine Phoenix as well. And so this is a program that I sort of like, um, you know, I do some of the logistics work. I do um, some behind the scenes stuff. I'm also on the ground. I sort of a mix of things. It's, um, I love it. And I'm honestly really honored to be a part of it. Um, so I just, I'm gonna go over some of the, the key things that we do here in the downtown Phoenix area. So Street Medicine Phoenix is student driven. Um, it's an interprofessional, um, interinstitutional team of you know, medical students, um, uh, PA students, nurse practitioner students, um, social work students, public health students um, from a variety of universities. So at this point we are um, almost at every single medical school in the Phoenix Valley. Um, we have with the most of our medical students come from University of Arizona. We also have from Creighton, Mayo, we're getting AT stills in Midwestern. Um, and then we have veterinary students from Midwestern and I'll kind of go over a little bit of that more. Um, we also have undergraduates from Arizona State University who are scribes. Um, we have, uh, you know, we're getting dental services again, we're doing optometry. Um, so that's kind of like just like a brief overview of what we're about. So it's student driven, um, you know, kind of staff run. So here at the College of Public Health, we do all of the support and um, a lot of the logistics, but we want to make sure that the students are kind of at the forefront and gaining these experiences. And, you know, we're kind of essentially trying to train the new generation of healthcare providers, um, not only how to, you know, interact with people, but what needs the homeless population here needs. Uh, Street Medicine Phoenix is part of the Street Medicine Institute. Uh, we're not the only program like this uh, by any means. This is a, a model based on one of, that originated in Pittsburgh a couple decades ago. And now there's a couple dozen around the country and even internationally, and they have a yearly um, conference as well. The mission of Street Medicine Phoenix is basically to ensure access to quality health care and to connect uh, people experiencing homelessness with the resources that they need. Um, you know, our vision really is to walk side by side with these individuals, um, when, especially when we go to the encampment downtown, you know, sometimes we can be the only person going out there. Um, so walking side by side, I think, is the best way to describe it because we, um, you know, work to, to overcome s stigmas amongst the medical students. We um, integrate ourselves in the community and we try to listen to their needs. Um, as I mentioned, we are interprofessional. So the vast majority of our students are medical students. We also have nursing students. Um, a lot of our medical students have an optometry uh, focus. We have public health students, nutrition students from ASU, social work students, um, a large amount of veterinary students from Midwestern. And you know everything that uh, basically anyone on the streets could ask for, we do our best to connect them. And that's what we're here for is to serve as like the middle ground and, and really bring in all the resources that are already existing. The core functions of Street Medicine Phoenix, um, the first one is that mobile health outreach, right? This, we do not have a brick and mortar. We keep all of our, our supplies in a certain building, but um, we're never going to have like a clinic um, by any means. This is, you know, we're going to the people, right? The people that are the most vulnerable and need the most um, care are also the least likely on the streets to go to a, um, you know, to an emergency room or a hospital or uh, have a primary care physician. And so going out onto the streets, into the tents, that is the basis of our uh, organization. We also have a massive focus on community resource navigation, um, especially amongst people experiencing homelessness. There's low phone usage. There's, you know, when they live in the encampment, a lot of times they're living there for several years at a time and they're just unaware of the resources that exist. So, you know, with social work students and with a lot of um, resources that the medical students and other students can put together, um, and the work that we here at the College of Public Health do, this is, you know, we're, we're going to those individuals to provide a way for them to navigate, you know, community organizations, whether that be, um, you know, detox for substances, whether that be uh, fairly qualified health centers, or, um, you know, I mean, I've referred people to uh, career navigation places, food uh, banks, um, especially near the Human Service Campus. Um, there's a lot, a lot of need for just like, descriptions and, and referrals of where, where organizations are. Last one is that advocacy and homelessness research. 
our co-founder um, who I have at the end, you'll see he, um, our, both our co-founders have a strong emphasis on homelessness research. And one of them um, at Walter Reed uh, Hospital over on the East Coast is working remotely basically to help all of our students publish get through IRBs. You know, we have currently a Narcan um, education on the streets research project going on. They're getting that through IRB. We have one with Mayo Clinic for a cardiology study um, with lipid panels. We have um, a heat study, heat relief study that was done over the summer with um, tents that were uh, established to lower the temperature within the tents. You know, we have at this point um, between, you know, those sort of on the ground experiments and then our social determinants of health studies and our um, you know, interprofessional case reports, uh, not to mention a monkeypox report that's coming out, hopefully coming out soon. Um, we have a, a pretty substantial amount of uh, research that's coming out of Street Medicine Phoenix, which is really exciting, especially for these interprofessional, interprofessional health sciences students. Our goals, the first one is essentially to reduce the reliance of this community on the emergency departments, right? Um, a lot of these uh, individuals experiencing homelessness have pretty acute needs that can be met on the spot, right? Whether that be wound care, um, you know, uh, medications for pain management, um, so pretty pretty basic um, healthcare services that they would otherwise go to an emergency department to. The second thing is to connect individuals experiencing homelessness with those ex existing community agencies. There really is an organization for everything, especially here in the Phoenix area. Um, we, I mean, any need that someone has, we can essentially meet in some way or another. And uh, not only does that help the community, but you know, the students here, the, 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 the faculty and the physicians who come out with us, they are able to uh, learn about it, right? From the resources that we provide. We're also aiming to expand the courage, the current knowledge base of the needs of the homeless population. Um, for example, from the social determinants of health studies and the need um, and the community health needs assessment that the co-founders did, they, they learned what needs the community has as opposed to us guessing what they are, are you know, needing and wanting living on the streets. Um, the other one is, you know, sort of as an overall arching goal is, is to decrease the prevalence of homelessness in the Phoenix metro area. You know, at the end of the day, we, we do realize that um, homelessness is a, is a uh, structural, um, you know, massive problem uh, throughout the country, but particularly here in Phoenix. And so if we can, you know, provide health care to a couple of individuals or a couple, a couple thousand, I suppose, um, and also, you know, work to decrease stigma and, and help these, um, these students connect them to resources, that's the overarching goal of our organization. The needs assessment was conducted in 2018 by our uh, by our co-founders, it's currently being updated. So hopefully in the next few months that will be coming out soon. Um, you know, they asked questions about, you know, I mean, all of you are in public health, you're familiar with needs assessments, but um, about health literacy and priority needs, um, because coming in, you know, as, as people who are medical students, as people who are physicians, the assumption is that they really just need health services. And the reality is a lot of the uh, care that they're asking for is stuff like transportation, supportive housing um, and, you know, education resources, whatever that may be. Uh, medical care and transportation are the priorities. Um, you know, people who seem um, satisfied with their living situation in a tent may, uh, you know, the vast majority of them just would like to be able to get places and be taken care of and are not, you know, at, at, I can't tell you how many people come up and, you know, ask for like the most basic thing. And then when I refer them to a, um, a supportive housing uh, organization or whatever it may be, they, they're just shocked that these things not only exist, but that they're um, able to be assisted, right? I think a lot of the stigma um, in society is also internalized through people experiencing homelessness. And they, you know, their, their main goal is really just to stay safe and Transportation and medical care are the are the are the stepping stones into that, getting them housed and getting them um, to where they can be living independently. So our um, our events operate in kind of a unique way. So we go um, to five main organizations, five main locations. The first one is to a community church here in downtown Phoenix, Grace Lutheran Church. We also go to Andre House which is a um, shelter and food and uh, meal service organization in downtown Phoenix. Um, we go to 
those Lodestar Day Resource Center, which is in the Human Services Campus. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Phoenix area and the homeless organizations here, but the Human Services Campus is a massive, I believe one square mile area in downtown Phoenix that houses a, a free homeless clinic, that houses a, a shelter, it has an optometry clinic, it has dental services, identification services, right? So if people can access those resources that are all together, I believe there's 16 organizations there, um, you know, that is really the goal. Um, hopefully, you know, they are working really hard to um, bridge the gap between homelessness and the, um, you know, on the on the spectrum of homelessness, on the most vulnerable end, they're serving those individuals, right? People living on the streets uh, who are chronically homeless. Um, we also go to, we're now going to a transitional housing unit, which is exciting because, you know, these individuals are sort of in the middle of that spectrum, more towards the homelessness end, but you know, people live there for two to three months and learn career um, skills and, and, you know, to try to get a job. And when they have housing, they're more able to, and, uh, and physically able to access um, resources. And so by going there, we're hoping to, to ensure that a medical problem is not what, what stops them from becoming housed eventually. Um, our, I have some pictures at the end. Uh, but the ma vast majority of our events are on the streets. These pictures here are from uh, fixed place locations, but you know the basis of street mess in Phoenix is those uh, street runs, we call them. So we go out, um, generally we go out to the encampment on 9th Avenue in Madison here in downtown Phoenix. Um, I don't know how many of you watch the news, but this is known as the zone because about 800 to 900 people are currently living in the zone. Uh, it is an encampment, so tents are set up all up and down the streets, um, uh, surrounding the Human Service Campus, surrounding Andre House, you know, surrounding um, Nourish Phoenix was a food bank. There's a large, large number of people living on the street, right? And some of these folks have been there for years. I mean, it's it really is uh, like a neighborhood or a small town. Um, and so that's where the vast majority of our uh, work is done. This is again all mobile, so this is not fixed place locations. We split up into two teams with wagons of supplies. So we have healthcare supplies, we have screening, right? Glucose screening. Um, I'll go in a little bit more in depth into our services soon. Um, we bring hygiene supplies, we bring MREs, we bring um, you know socks, uh, protein powder, whatever we can get our hands on. We're getting water from Saint Vincent de Paul. We're soon getting uh, non-perishable snacks from Saint Mary's Food Bank. Um, we're, we're really trying to provide, you know, services that they are requesting and that they could use. And so um, I have some pictures later, which will kind of give a better idea, but I think this is, you know, one thing to take away from this presentation is really that we're going out onto the streets and um, where those people living in tents are not coming to us. This is the mobile health unit that um, Shayla talked about, this is the one in Phoenix. I just wanted to mention this because we do occasionally use it, um, you know, when we have HIV screenings or whatever it may be, this is a really nice um, unit to use on the streets because it's mobile, obviously, and this is able to be used all up and down the encampment. The services we provide, um, you know, the main ones include blood pressure and blood glucose screenings, um, uh, uh, physical health assessments. We do a lot of acute wound care, um, a lot of foot care. Um, we're also doing some vaccinations, but I think wound care and screenings are our biggest um, services. We also have established several teams for the other services on this. Um, so, you know, to begin with, we were having, you know, all the teams go out and we all try to do everything, right? All the students would do, you know, wound care, some would distribute Narcan, and it just ended up being um, that certain items would be forgotten. So the way that we've kind of worked on this is developing subgroups. So these are dedicated students that um, every single week come out and do these services. So we currently have a Narcan team and there's six students on there and their, you know, their role is to come out every single week and go with us to distribute Narcan. Now this has been so successful that they're expanding into, um, I'm kind of rebranding it to overdose prevention. So they'll hopefully be expanding into some harm reduction um, services as well. Um, our vision screening is the optometry team now. We have several students dedicated who go to actually fixed place locations um, with an auto refractor, which is an automatic, um, it's like a small machine, maybe the size of a textbook that um, is used to uh, provide prescriptions, both near sight and a distance, uh, near vision and distance vision. So this is done mostly by um, Mayo students. We also have a Midwestern um, op ophthalmologist who comes out 
and they not only uh, screen for vision and provide prescriptions, but we partner with New Eyes for the Needy, which is an organization that um, provides free glasses and will mail them to people experiencing homelessness. Now, obviously, um, it's, it's occasionally an issue we run into where they don't have uh, mailboxes, but being at fixed place locations, such as a shelter or at the church, um, the or New Eyes for the Navy is able to mail them to those um, organizations, say the Human Services Campus, where people are living there, and um, that's how they get their glasses. Uh, we're also, we also have a new menstrual hygiene team, which is um, sort of a women's health team. They started out similar to an Arcan team where they were just distributing period products, and they have expanded into, you know, providing pregnancy tests, giving safer sex supplies, um, and then connecting them with resources, right? They have a lot of domestic vi uh, violence victims. There's, it's, it's so much more than just the first thing that we set them out to kind of do, right? They've discovered the need that has, is there and, and they've connected with the individuals there. They've developed relationships and they're really able to learn and, and gain um, the information that we need to help serve the community best. There's also um, some other uh, services we provide. One of them that's not on here is uh, veterinary services. And I have another picture, but we partner the Midwestern University veterinary students come out once a month with us. Um, there's about 10 or 15 of them. They come out with a veterinary preceptor and they um, microchipped uh, dogs and cats. They vaccinate. They also have dog food and cat food. They have leashes, you know, but if you think about um, the vaccination aspect, this is truly one of the most important um, uh, focuses in terms of housing people, because um, as you're all probably familiar, a lot of people experiencing homelessness own pets. And if they're not vaccinated against rabies and the core vaccine, um, any housing list, any transitional housing list, um, any housing assistance list that they're on, they won't be able to uh, attain housing, right? So like um, some of the transitional housing units have waiting lists of several hundred people. And if their dog is not vaccinated and they're obviously not willing to part with it because it provides a lot of emotional support um, that prevents them from getting housing. So their vaccination of dogs and cats, dogs in particular, is really important in housing people, which is something that um, I think is interesting because I don't think anyone would have thought of that as being um, you know, a need in the community, right? I think when I, if you just told someone that they're vaccinating dogs in the encampment, the first thing you would think of is, is that, you know, it's preventing the spread of uh, animal diseases, which is true, but at the same time, it has an, a, a ripple effect, right? So I think that's the basis of Street Medicine Phoenix is like, how can we work in, work through in the system and work with the, the community to like find ways that they can um, access resources. These are just a few pictures of veterinary services on the left. They all have like 15 students. And so this is a, a quick snapshot of the encampment. I don't know if you can see back here, there is tents. So these tents line up and down the street. These are the Midwestern students who go out with uh, vaccines, dog food, et cetera. This is a menstrual health team. They come out with period supplies um, and a variety of other uh, menstrual health items. These are some more pictures. Uh, top left is just like a group picture of everyone. I, you know, I try to make it as uh, as engaging, as fun as I can for the students um, because we have around 300 students on our roster um, for the, the monthly emails for the sign up list. Uh, I mean, the sign up genius is full in about three to five minutes on average, so it's in high demand. And I want to keep the students engaged. You know, we want to ensure that these students feel um, supported by us and that they're making a difference. And so by connecting them, you know, keep making sure they're connecting with each other and with the other uh, schools that they're working with, um, it's sort of, you know, it makes everyone feel like they belong. Uh, on at the bottom, those pictures are just when we do our debriefs at the beginning of the end, right? Um, we go over what they need to do, um, you know, how we go down the streets. Um, it's a pretty unique experience. I'd say the majority of students have never dealt with people experiencing homelessness. So this is a learning experience, right? Um, you know, I have always been impressed by their empathy and compassion. Um, at first, you know, when I first started, I was a little hesitant about whether, you know, these students who've never worked with people experiencing homelessness would know how to interact with them. But honestly, I've never encountered a single student who's, you know, had a, ne a negative experience. Even if a client, even if a participant doesn't want to participate with us, they can still engage them in conversation and, and you know, provide even some, um, some validation and emotional support. 
These are some of our partners. Uh, we partner a lot with AZDHS, Maricopa County. Um, the Human Services Campus is where that uh, where we go very often to provide screenings, and they're also just like a fantastic organization of Phoenix. Um, Spectrum has also done. I'm sorry, Spectrum Medical has done some HIV and STI testing for us. We do have a new. Um, we're starting a new HIV team, hopefully here soon, and so we'll be partnering with more people, um, including the Southwest Recovery Alliance, for some harm reduction things. And then these are our funders. Uh, you know, we couldn't do this without them. Um, we get our water from St. Vincent. We get socks from Bombas. We get period products from Women for Women. We get, uh, you know, funding from AHEC and Arizona Family Health, Molina. The health sciences has been so supportive. Uh, obviously, the College of Public Health is where this is based, and the College of Public Health is is where she, Madison Phoenix is uh, is home. Um, and so we just really want to thank everyone for all of their support. And this would not be possible without the amazing individuals and organizations who support us. This is just some last characteristics uh, like of the demographic we work with, um, just so you guys get sort of an idea. Um, the majority are middle aged. Uh, there's a, a lot of substance use. So, you know, with our harm reduction team, we're hoping to not only address um, overdoses, but prevent them um, right before that they can happen. Uh, there's a lot of veterans out there. Um, there's a lot of alcohol use, just a lot of substance use in general. Um, not a whole lot of uh, health insurance, although as you can see, around 75% are on access. Um, now this is uh, generally not on the street. This is at other places where they have some linkage to resources in the encampment itself. Um, I don't have the demographic data up for that yet, but that is generally a lower number of people without insurance. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we do have a variety of services. This is some numbers. Um, this I haven't been able to update this yet, but I was just going to verbally kind of update these um, to you all. Uh, our vision screenings are now up to about 400. Um, our Narcan kits with the new Narcan distribution team is hovering around 1600, and we just got um, some more, so hopefully that'll be out um, soon. We are distributing that about 50 Narcans per run, uh, so that's like one of our most valuable uh, supplies. Um, we probably have around 700 referrals um, to federally, health uh, federally qualified health centers and other uh, service organizations. Um, and then for glasses, we're around 200 um, in terms of ordering glasses. Socks is around uh, 15,000. And then um, wound care is generally, I'm thinking it, it's generally in the 500, 600 area. Um, hygiene care kits. That's going to be about uh, 35 to 400, 3,500 to 4,000. Uh, Maricopa County Public Health provided us with a large number of them that we distributed really quickly. So we're just thankful for all of our partners who have made this possible. And lastly, here is some contact information. My email is on there, um, as well as the community or College of Public Health Community Outreach and Engagement Coordinator Alma Ramirez, who also you know, works very closely with Shayla. She is the lead of the Mobile Health Unit here in Phoenix. Um, our medical director, Dr. Fowler, there at the top, um, our co-founders at the bottom, and then we have our social media there. Um, our website is, I believe, maybe having some issues. So, you know, go ahead and email us if you have any questions. Uh, our social media is being updated. So thank you so much for having me. It was, um, you know, great to talk. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or our, our email. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, both of you, for all the work that you're doing out in the community um, and taking time to uh, spend it with us here today. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to address for the Mobile Health Unit or Street Medicine Phoenix at this moment? Um, I have one quick question and just um, for the sake of time, just one. Are any showers needed? Terry is asking if there's any showers that are needed. Catherine, I believe that's more of a question for you. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. Um, showers, I mean, they are needed. We we don't necessarily have a way of providing those, although some of the events we go to, um, we go to one on Juneteenth uh, that partners with Salvation Army in Tempe, and they have um, like a laundry unit. It's, it's like a big bus that has uh, washing machines and dryers, and then they also have a shower unit there. So that's what I can think of for that. Um, it is a little complicated in the encampment, but um, that is needed. They also are provided at Andre House and the shelter in the Human Service Campus. Perfect, thank you. 
Um, so just one quick question. And if you could like narrow it down in 30 seconds, like what's your number one way that you think is the most um, effective way to make these um, the build a rapport with the community so that they trust you and they can receive the services that you're providing? Sorry, it's a loaded question. <laughs> is this for both of us? Okay, Shayla, you, you can go for Okay. Uh, I think kind of similar to what Catherine was saying about talking to community members, because they really are the ones that can tell us what it is that they need or what connections they need. And I, I think that is why the mobile health units have been so successful, because we literally go to the community and, and try to provide as much as we can, and if not, try to find the people to, help, to try to help them. Um, but yeah, I think it's just uh, taking the time to know your community members. Um, and then if they tell you, hey, there's I have so-and-so neighbor that also needs some help. And then that neighbor will tell you about another neighbor. I mean, I, I think that is where I would say is the most important thing is actually taking time to get to know your community. And even like volunteering on things with the mobile health unit or with street medicine, I they make a big difference. Like all of us, I think here are in public health, but it's not until we take time to actually be a part of programs that provide a direct service that we see like, there's a lot, there's probably a lot more that we can do. Um, but yeah, that's my short and quick answer. Catherine? Yeah, um, that is an awesome question. Um, just so you know, Chad, in the chat, I'm just going to write my answer in the chat for you since we don't have much time. But um, Priscilla, um, I think what Shayla said is essentially what Street Medicine does as well. Um, going into the community is the most important thing. I think, you know, when we go into the streets, when we go up, like we literally come with wagons, like walk in front of tents and ask, you know, people who are sitting outside people who are like smoking a cigarette outside their tent or whatever, asking them, uh, hi, you know, we're here with you, Miss in Phoenix. Is there anything that we can help you with, um, with any health needs you have, or can we connect you to resources? And just like starting a conversation with them. And uh, the other thing is that we do provide other like non-medical supplies. So those hygiene kits, MREs, snacks, water, sometimes we'll use that as a way to engage them and approach them, right? So if they come up to us because they know we have water and then we can start asking them, um, you know, uh, that wound on your leg. Uh, when was the last time you got that, right? Or whatever it may be. That's, I think, the most important way that we can connect with people. And I think that's it's important to talk about, like, the people on our, on our team, Priscilla, because, like, just like Catherine, everybody on our team is very motivated, very dedicated to the community. So things like that come almost really naturally to them to where they are just can start up conversation with anybody. And, I, and, that, and that makes a big difference, I think. I think the staff that works with Mobile Health Unit and Street Medicine um, definitely help create that rapport in the community. Great, well, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Catherine and Shayla for your presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, please, please feel free to contact um, me and we'll be sharing this information out. Um, and so we do have one last comment from Daniel here that mobile showers, um, something called Clean the World Foundation. Um, so maybe that's something that's what we're here for. We're community within ourselves so that we can help each other out. So thank you all very much. Um, hopefully we can see you next week. We will be having an antibiotic resistance, same time, same place. Um, so you all have a great day and thank you so much. Thank you, Priscilla. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. Thank you.